Okay, so my talk today is about uh, diffusion in very steep concentration gradients. And uh, the reason why uh, I went into this in detail is because I think there is a serious problem with some of the theory that we use in calculating, for example, the growth rate of ferrite. And there is more information on this website link, which will appear later on in the, in the course of the talk as well. So you don't need to note it down. And you can download the actual presentation from the link that is on the chat box. So the type of ferrite that I'm going to talk about is this, which we call a lotromorphic ferrite. And basically it forms at the austenite grain boundaries and then thickens in directions normal normal to that. And this happens to be a picture of IIT Kharagpur, which I took um, when, uh, when I visited India for the first time. Okay, so if you go back to 1855, uh, when Adolf Fick was looking at the mixing of salty water and water which doesn't contain salt. So he was actually looking at diffusion in liquids and he was in the department of anatomy, uh, not, not materials, okay? And basically what he decided was that this mixing will happen uh, in a way that makes the rate of mixing proportional to the concentration gradient. So this is what we call the flux, the diffusion flux. This is the gradient of concentration. Z is uh, distance, and D is the proportionality constant between the flux and the thing that drives the diffusion, which is this concentration gradient. And the minus sign comes because the flux is going that way, but the gradient is in the opposite direction, it's negative. So to make the flux uh, positive, you have to have this minus sign to cancel out the fact that the gradient is negative. Okay, because diffusion, according to Fick, happens down a concentration gradient. So this is basically Fick's law of diffusion, which we use um, and teach routinely. And it was uh, in 1855. It has its origins in many of these kinds of laws, uh, where you know the flux is proportional to a force, and I'll come back to those uh, towards the end of the lecture. The different kinds of laws. So this is fixed diffusion equation. And you can immediately explain why this cannot be correct. So this is a picture that was taken by my sister when she went to the Antarctica. And you can see some ice floating in the ocean. And the ice is almost pure water, whereas the ocean contains salt. That means that there is a huge concentration gradient between the water in the sea and the ice. But you still don't have any diffusion. No matter how long you leave this, the ice will remain as pure water. Okay. So why is it not obeying Fix's law of diffusion, even though there is a large concentration gradient between the salty water in the sea and the ice, which is pure water? So it doesn't obey Fix's law of diffusion. So there must be something not right about this. Okay, I need to explain to you the concept of a chemical potential. So here I'm plotting uh, a, the energy, the free energy of a mixture of A and B. And it, that can be in the solid or it can be in the liquid where the A is the water and the B is the salt or it could be iron and manganese, whatever. We're talking about a solution because the free energy varies gently with the chemical composition. And if I take a particular mixture of A and B and I draw a tangent to that point on the curve, then the intercepts are mu A and mu B. And the free energy of the solution at that composition is G of X. So I can simply write a straight line equation for this, that the G of X is simply the weighted mean of mu A and mu B, because 
x here is the concentration of B, and 1 minus x is the concentration of A. So the chemical potential is simply the average free energy of an A atom in a solution of a particular composition per mole of that solution. And similarly, you should think about the chemical potential of B as simply being the free energy of a B atom in a solution of that composition. So that is the meaning, the physical meaning of chemical potential, that it defines the contribution of an A atom to the free energy of that solution and the contribution of a B atom to the free energy of the solution. So don't worry about the equations which define chemical potential. It's actually very, very simple that mu A and mu B simply represent the contributions of those particular elements to that solution. And of course, uh, if my solution has a different composition, then this would change. Okay, so these chemical potentials are a function of the composition X. So if I now go back to the ice and water problem, I have two phases. One is the solid ice and the other one is the seawater. And this is the same diagram with free energy being plotted on the vertical axis and the salt concentration on the horizontal axis. Whoops, sorry. So if you look at a common tangent between these two curves, then obviously the intercepts for ice and for seawater are exactly identical, which means that the free energy of a molecule of water in the sea is the same as the free energy of a molecular water in ice. And similarly, for sodium chloride in sea is the same as for sodium chloride in ice. So although there is a big difference in the concentration, the concentration is given on this horizontal axis, there is no difference in the free energy of a sodium chloride at a molecule in seawater and the sodium chloride molecule in ice. So there cannot be anything that can drive that reaction. So what we have to say is that diffusion is not driven by a concentration gradient. It's driven by a free energy gradient. So if there's a difference in the free energies of, uh, if this is not an equality, then you would get the transfer of salt from one phase to the other, okay? So this is how a phase diagram is calculated, where phase equilibria are defined by drawing common tangents between the free energy curves of the particular solutions. Okay, so here is a single solution, a single phase, and this could represent uh, Fix's experiment where he had water with a high concentration of salt and water with a smaller concentration of salt. So X1 and X2 are different here. And you can see that the free energy of manganese in this solution is different from the free energy of manganese in this solution. So here, there would be a driving force which is given by these differences here in the chemical potentials of iron and manganese to homogenize for the solution to become uniform. Uh, later on, I will show you a case where the shape of the free energy curve is different and therefore there will be a tendency to unmix. So this kind of a shape happens when different kinds of atoms like to be next to each other. But there is another scenario where they want to be next to their own kind, in which case there would be a tendency to separate. But I'll come back to that later. So what drives diffusion is a difference in chemical potential. So in this particular case, the way in which the chemical potential changes with concentration is that if, if the concentration increases from X1 to X2, then the chemical potential increases. So uh, d mu by dc is positive, which means that unlike atoms prefer to be next to each other. This is the opposite case where d mu by dc is less than zero. That means if I increase the concentration, I get a reduction in the chemical potential, okay? So um, this scenario would say that, look, if I start off with a homogeneous uh, composition in the middle there, then 
it would spontaneously tend to decompose into manganese rich and manganese poor regions. So this is how we started off with, with the composition identified by the arrow. But given time, you will get a composition wave developing in which you actually get diffusion up a concentration gradient to build up manganese rich and manganese poor regions. So this is called uphill diffusion. And it's the case when you have a free energy curve like this, where the minima in these curves come at the manganese rich and the iron rich regions. So this is called spinodal decomposition, where if you're watching a homogeneous solution, it will spontaneously tend to decompose into a composition wave. Okay, so we have Fix's equation at the top, which says, you know, the flux is proportional to the concentration gradient. But we've now decided that that cannot be correct. It must be proportional to the free energy gradient, which is d mu by dz. And we have another proportionality constant, which we call mobility to relate the flux and the force. This concentration term just comes in here because mu is per unit concentration, okay? So we have Fix's law and we have this, uh, which is the correct expression for the flux. If I expand this, uh, then I can write d mu by dz as d mu by dc times dc by dz. Okay. And notice that these two terms are identical. And therefore, the diffusion co coefficient you discover is actually a function of the free energy and how it varies with concentration. So if we write the diffusion coefficient with this thermodynamic factor, then it takes account of the fact that diffusion depends on a free energy gradient. And depending on the sign of this, diffusion will happen down the concentration gradient or uphill diffusion, or if this is zero, then there will be no diffusion at all. Okay. So this is a quite a powerful result, uh, which expresses the diffusion coefficient in terms of a thermodynamic quantity, and therefore properly takes account of flux as a function of the chemical potential gradient. Okay, so with this basic introduction, I'm going to go into the growth kinetics of uh, ferrite. And you can assume that we are taking the diffusion coefficient not as defined by Fixed's law, but as defined by this equation here. I won't go into detail on that. Uh, the good thing is that by doing this, we can substitute D in the normal kinetic theory uh, that has existed for a long time. So here we are, we are looking at the thickening kinetics of ferrite in steel. And this is the iron carbon phase diagram. We are plotting temperature versus concentration. And let's assume that we are transforming at a particular temperature T. The average composition of our alloy is C bar. This is the equilibrium concentration in austenite, which is in contact with ferrite. And this is the equilibrium concentration in ferrite, which is in contact with austenite. And of course, this is much smaller than this. So while this is growing, we will develop a concentration profile, which looks like this, where this is the equilibrium composition of the ferrite. This is the equilibrium composition of the austenite. The far field composition we are assuming is unchanged. And uh, I'm making the approximation here that this gradient is a straight line, and this is a diffusion distance. Z star is the position of the interface. In other words, the thickness of the ferrite. Okay, so this is standard uh, representation of diffusion control growth, and there are two terms in that. So imagine that uh, I, at a certain time t, I have this black concentration profile, and a short time later, this has moved okay, uh, to a different position because the ferrite has become thicker. Then in order to get this red profile from the black profile, I've got to push this much carbon out of the way okay, and into the austenite. And that 
that quantity per unit time is simply this minus this times the rate at which the interface moves. So this is the rate at which you have to partition solute as the ferrite thickens. Now, in order to maintain these concentrations here uh, as constant, because they are connected by local equilibrium at the interface. So if you want to assume that growth occurs with local equilibrium at the interface, then this composition must not change. Can somebody please mute their microphone? Okay, so if this concentration is not to change, then you've got to carry this extra carbon which has been partitioned into the austenite by diffusion down this gradient. So that is, of course, uh, our equation here, where D is now includes the thermodynamic functions that I said. So this flux is down this gradient. And those two terms must be equal if we are to maintain equilibrium at the interface. So we can write this equation and approximate dc by dz by, you know, just taking this as a straight line. Uh, so we have another unknown here, which is very easy to solve because we require mass balance, that the amount of carbon not absorbed by the ferrite must be equal to the amount of carbon absorbed by the austenite. So that is easy to solve. And then you have uh, a simple matter of integrating this equation and you find that the thickness of the ferrite is proportional to the square root of time, which is a parabolic thickening. And this law actually applies very generally to any process in which the diffusion distance increases with time. So in this case, as the ferrite becomes thicker and thicker, you are putting more and more carbon in the austenite, so delta Z must increase with time. So if you think about ice forming on a pond, okay, uh, then the distance through which the heat has to diffuse increases with time as the ice becomes thicker. And therefore, the gradients here become gentler, and therefore, the thickening rate of the ice decreases with time. And that is why, you know, ponds and rivers do not freeze completely. Okay, very important for the fish. And uh, if you are soldering something, then the reaction between the solder and the substrate. Uh, if to form an intermetallic compound, the thickening will be parabolic because the diffusion happens both ways uh, for the compound to form. And if the compound is thicker, then the diffusion distance is thicker. Same thing applies to oxidation, where if the oxidation rate is governed by oxygen diffusing through the oxide, then it will be parabolic with time, exactly as illustrated in, in this graph here. So this is quite a, a generic result. But you know, there is no, absolutely no steel available, which only has carbon and iron. Okay, of the 1.6 billion tons of steel, I'll bet you, you will not be able to find anything which is just iron and carbon, because the other elements are very useful. So we have to generalize our binary phase diagram into ternary and higher order phase diagrams, but the principles remain exactly the same. So this now is a free energy surface in three dimensions, all right? It's like, like a half a football. Uh, it's not a curve. And this also is a free energy surface as a function of carbon and manganese. And to find the equilibrium, instead of a common tangent, we draw a tangent plane which touches both of these surfaces at the equilibrium compositions and defines a tie line on your phase diagram. However, we have an extra degree of freedom because you can rock, rock this tangent plane while maintaining contact with both of those free energy surfaces. In other words, at a constant temperature, we can get an infinite number of tie lines which form an alpha plus gamma phase field at a constant temperature. So this phase field is completely defined by the tie lines obtained by rocking this plane at a constant temperature. In a binary, you only have one tie line at a constant temperature. So this gives us a little bit of flexibility as you will see later. 
And equilibrium, once again, is defined by the free energies of the individual components being identical in both phases, because this is a common tangent plane. OK, so here is uh, the same diagram here, uh, plotted out uh, in two dimensions here. Okay, I'm plotting the manganese versus the carbon, and you have an infinite number of tie lines where any one of them satisfies the equilibrium condition that the chemical potentials of the components are equal in both phases. Okay? And notice this is at a, a constant temperature. Now, in the binary case, uh, we had this equation which said the rate of solute being partitioned must equal to the diffusion flux from the interface in order to maintain equilibrium at the interface. Okay, so this is the constraint we are working to that we prefer to have equilibrium at the interface. Now, for a ternary case uh, where there are two solutes, we have two equations. Okay, so they are of the same form as this. That means that the rate at which carbon is partitioned must equal to the flux away from the interface and the rate at which manganese is partitioned must equal to the flux away from the interface. But now we have a big problem, okay? Uh, can we actually maintain equilibrium at the interface? Because the diffusion coefficient of carbon typically is eight orders of magnitude bigger than of manganese. So how on earth can the flux of manganese keep up with the flux of carbon. There must be a breakdown of local equilibrium. These terms are different, but not different by eight orders of magnitude, okay? So we have a problem about maintaining local equilibrium. And the way that Coates uh, back in the early 70s solved this, he said, look, we have a choice of tie lines, if I go back, um, Oops, sorry. If I go back, we, we actually have a whole choice of tie lines, all right? Uh, the tie line doesn't have to pass through your alloy composition. So if we choose a tie line which maximizes the gradient of manganese to compensate for the low manganese diffusivity, then we may be able to keep pace with the flux of carbon. So what we want to do is choose a tie line that will dramatically increase the gradient of manganese to compensate for the low diffusion coefficient, and then these fluxes can happily keep pace. So here is our manganese carbon phase diagram, and let's say that we have taken this alloy from the austenitic condition and cooled it into the two-phase alpha plus gamma phase field, all right? So it is austenitic to begin with, and I want to select a tie line which will maximize the gradient of manganese. Now, what that means is that I must not partition too much manganese, okay? That means the ferrite concentration of manganese must be similar to that in your alloy, because if you partition a lot of manganese, then clearly uh, it will slow the flux down. So I draw a construction line here, to select this tie line, which gives me almost identical manganese concentration in the ferrite as in the alloy. So you can see that we end up with a very steep manganese concentration gradient, and the composition of the ferrite is almost identical to that of the alloy. So we call this negligible partitioning because there is some partitioning, otherwise, we would not be able to maintain equilibrium. All right. And the corresponding gradient for carbon would be long range diffusion of carbon. So both of these factors help us to allow the manganese to keep pace with the carbon. And this is called the negligible partitioning local equilibrium mode of transformation. And you know, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of papers which use this concept. Uh, of ferrite growth with very little partitioning. Okay, the problem, the very big problem, okay? Now the, the, the concept has become much more popular since the availability of software 
such as Dictra and MatCalc, because these calculations are, you know, manually quite difficult to do. Uh, these pieces of software can do them routinely. But uh, I would argue that most of that is being used without sufficient thought to what's going on. Because look, if you look at these papers, which use that concept, the width of the concentration profile here, the diffusion distance, is ridiculously small. Okay? There is no way that you can achieve a, a width diffusion distance, which is of the order of an atom size. Yep. Uh, and in this case, even smaller than an atom size. And actually, Coates, uh, in the early 1970s, realized this problem, but at that time, uh, he didn't deal with it, uh, or it wasn't possible to deal with it. So, it's physically impossible to achieve this. And I'll explain to you why that is the case, that we cannot have inconceivably small concentration uh, uh, distances, uh, diffusion distances. And you know, people even use this for calculations. Uh, so these particular calculations are for electromorphic ferrite, but people even use these for bainite, which happens at 400 degrees centigrade or less. And it's, you will have diffusion distances which are 10 to the minus 10 of a, a meter or 10 to the minus 15 of a meter, which simply doesn't make sense. Okay, going back to uh, the case where we have a region of a free energy curve where the atoms prefer to be next to their own kind and therefore there are these two minima. And there's a region here where the change in chemical potential with composition um, is, is um, negative. Okay, that means that if I have a solution of this composition, it can spontaneously decompose into a solid rich and a solid poor region by uphill diffusion. And iron chrome alloys are classic uh, in this respect, that they undergo this decomposition, where if you're holding a completely mixed solution of iron and chromium atoms, it will tend to develop composition waves. Uh, and these waves start off uh, from a completely homogeneous solution. This is a, a showing the uh, waves developing in three dimensions, and they grow in amplitude, okay, as time proceeds. Uh, so this is a, an actual um, simulation of the development of these composition waves. And we can pick them up by electron diffraction, by microanalysis, atom probe, et cetera, et cetera. That's not a problem. Now, the movie at the bottom is a simulation of the universe. So after the Big Bang, uh, the universe was completely dark, all right, for about 100 million years because, and that's the first dark ages, uh, because the matter was completely uniformly distributed. And then it started to aggregate. And you know, the reasons why it started to aggregate are, are still uh, a matter of um, speculation, uh, but uh, not completely speculation because using certain assumptions, you can simulate it exactly like the movie at the top, where the matter starts off as uniform, and then starts to cluster. And only when you develop these clusters of matter that stars appear, and then there is light in the universe. So we had, we actually had a hundred million of dark, hundred million years of dark ages before there were finally candles in the sky. So this is a story that you can tell everybody uh, to uh, inspire them. So Carlos Martens uh, uh, was an astron astrophysicist in my college. And when he was talking about this, I realized that there is a strong analogy between this and the iron chromium solution. Okay, so the problem with the simulation of um, uh, the composition wave developing is that obviously, you know, if the wavelength is small, then the wave can develop much more rapidly because the diffusion distance is reduced. So you get to the absurd result that the composition wave which will dominate everything 
is one with an infinitely small or an atomic size wavelength. That doesn't make sense, okay? And this problem was solved by Hillert and by Hilliard and Kahn, where they showed that there is a cost in developing a steep concentration gradient, uh, such as would be the case if the wavelength of this composition wave was very small. And that cost is twofold. One is that obviously if you have lattice parameter gradients, then you will have strain energy. And I'm going to neglect that uh, in, in this uh, talk because it's a small factor when we come to ferrite. And the other is, you know, if you have chemistry varying, then there is a kind of an interfacial energy. So if you make the wavelength smaller, that interfacial energy, even though there is no real interface, there is a variation in composition, uh, that becomes expensive. So let me show you how Hilliard treated this. So imagine we have a homogeneous solution, all right? And this is the free energy per atom of a homogeneous solution. Then I can expand that free energy uh, as a, a polynomial function of the gradient of concentration and the second derivative of the gradient of concentration, and you can go on forever. So this is just a polynomial expansion of the free energy of a heterogeneous solution as a function of that of a homogeneous solution. And these quantities here, A, represent the gradient of concentration and the second derivative. So the free energy of a heterogeneous solution is not the same as that of a homogeneous solution. So uh, if I substitute for A and B, then I get the free energy of a heterogeneous solution is that of a homogeneous solution plus a term which depends on the gradient, on the second derivative of the gradient, and the square of the gradient. Now this term cannot exist for um, the sort of things we are dealing with where crystals are centrosymmetric because you can't have the free energy changing with the sign of the gradient, okay? So we can, we can uh, eliminate that term and integrate over the whole volume. So we now only have the free energy of the homogeneous solution, the second derivative, and this uh, square of the concentration gradient. So sign doesn't matter here because we have a square. And then if I do some mathematical manipulation involving integration by parts, then this is the equation we end up with, that for a heterogeneous solution, the free energy will depend on that of the homogeneous solution and the square of the concentration gradient. And this is called the gradient energy coefficient K. This is just the volume, volume of an atom. So this is a very important result that free energy will depend on the square of the concentration gradient. Normally, we completely ignore this term, okay? Because it is relatively small when the gradients are gentle. But it cannot be ignored when the gradients are steep. And I did some calculations using this to show that, you know, if the diffusion distance is 0.2 of a nanometer, I'm using up something like 100 joules per mole. If I go to 0 0.03, it will be so large that ferret transformation just becomes impossible. So this concept is impossible, okay? You will not be able to get local equilibrium if you have concentration gradients, which do not take account of this term, which are so steep that the energy due to that gradient exceeds the driving force for transformation. So this is, a, uh, this is the most important conclusion in this talk, that the gradient energy term will completely oppose the development of negligible partitioning local equilibrium. This is a calculation that I did using uh, data from iron chromium systems and uh, calculated freely as a function of the gradient. But the papers that are published will have gradients which fall in this region with much higher free energy is required. Typical driving force for electromorphic ferrite formation is about 100 joules per mole. 
So anything about that will make this mode of transformation physically impossible. Okay, so the conclusion is that this mode of transformation does not exist. And there are more details in, these two in, in this paper. The second paper is that, uh, I will come back to that, okay, the second paper. So the negligible partition in local equilibrium mode has never been observed experimentally, although widely implemented in software and reported. And the reason is that when people make measurements of the growth rate of ferrite, they are very crude. Okay? So they will involve you know, a partial transformation quenching, partial transformation after a longer time quenching, and so on. So you're not looking at the same layer of ferrite anyway. And you know, since uh, Honeycomb and Aronson passed away, people have forgotten that ferrite actually grows by a ledge mechanism, even when you are measuring the growth rate of ferrite by a decarburization experiment, there's no reason why, as Aronson once said, uh, you cannot have a ledge mechanism operating. And the kinetics for a ledge mechanism are completely different from those of a uniform movement of the interface. Back in 1980, I wrote a paper to explain the measurement that are needed to verify this. And no one has bothered to do them, even though we have you know, the most advanced instruments now to characterize concentration profiles at interfaces. Uh, if you look at perlite, perlite never transforms without the partitioning of solute. Okay? So this is a partition coefficient by Chance and Ridley. And at any temperatures, even at the lowest of temperatures, for example, where bainite forms, the partition coefficient is greater than one and far, far less than equilibrium. And this is another thing I, I want to highlight. There are lots and lots of papers where people compare the composition at which a bainite reaction stops with the negligible, negligible partitioning local equilibrium boundary. That makes no sense at all, because even if this concept existed, it's not a limit once you get to that composition, the driving force decreases and you tend towards the A3 concept with partitioning of everything. Okay, I want to um, show you something going back to the first part of the lecture. There is this concept called irreversible thermodynamics, which is incredibly powerful, uh, although it is approximate. And what it says is that if I have a flux, for example, the diffusion flux, and a force, for example, the chemical potential gradient, if I multiply them, that is equal to the rate of energy dissipation. So this is the rate of entropy production, and this is temperature. So if I multiply these two, it's the rate of energy dissipation. So energy dissipation is, you know, supposing you see a ball rolling down a hill, uh, and it's a completely straight hill, then an observer on the ball doesn't see a change, but its energy is changing, okay? So it's dissipating energy. So if, if I can write an equation like this, that the flux multiplied by the force gives me the rate of energy dissipation, then I, pr I will prove to you that the flux will be proportional to the force. So if I expand, the flux with respect to the force, uh, then as a polynomial here, then this term must be zero because there's no flux when the force is zero. And you know we generally ignore high order terms. So you recover that the flux should be proportional to the force, okay? And this is why you know, in this uh, uh, modification of Fix's law, you have the flux proportional to the chemical potential gradient, the free energy gradient. So in any situation where the product of the force and the flux gives you the rate of energy dissipation, the flux will be proportional to the force up to some experimental limit. Uh, so, so going back to fix his paper, which was in 1855, it actually built on the work that was done previously on the diffusion of heat. So this is the paper by Fourier, uh, 
1822 here where he says you know the flux is proportional to the gradient of temperature now again this doesn't satisfy the irreversible thermodynamics because the product of dt by dz and j doesn't give us an energy dissipation rate this is uh, ohm's law where the current is proportional to the voltage and the proportionality constant is one upon r now if i take this flux and multiply it by this force sure enough i get an energy dissipation rate because current times voltage gives me energy per time and this paper was in 1827 this is uh, the original paper by newton in 1701 and of course it's written in latin but notice that thermometer has the same meaning in Latin as in English. Okay. Uh, and in that he gave the classic Newton's uh, cooling law, where the rate at which temperature changes with time is proportional to uh, the difference in temperature. 1701, okay? And we are still using those. But if you express them in terms of the concepts of irreversible thermodynamics, then for Ohm's law, this becomes the gradient of the electromotive force. For heat flux, we have to have this additional term one upon T because the heat flux itself is an energy dissipation term. So this must be canceled out. The dimensions of temperature must be canceled out. And in diffusion, you've already seen that. And um, I met a, a, a professor at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore who was looking at the relationships between stress and strain rate. And again, it's the same thing. If I multiply these two, then you will find that that gives you the energy dissipation rate because a megapascal is actually an energy and a strain rate is per unit time. So if I multiply that two, you get an energy dissipation rate. So all of these processes are consistent with irreversible thermodynamics when you define them in this manner. Okay, so I will, I will end uh, the talk here and I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, so questions you should put on your chat line and I think you can unmute your microphones. So put, put your question on chat and then I'll pick you up. Oh, somebody's drawing red lines again. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so um, there are, there's a question, a very good question, uh, and it says, "How do we define para equilibrium?" So, I haven't uh, discussed para equilibrium. Para equilibrium means that there is absolutely no partitioning at all of the substitutional solutes, but subject to that, carbon partitions. And that actually is experimentally verified, for example, in the growth of uh, uh, weedman sarden ferrite and also vanadium hydride. Uh, you do not get any partitioning of substitutional solutes, so the concentration profile is completely flat. And uh, you get partitioning of the interstitials. <coughs> so para-equilibrium is a, an established concept, uh, but it can only happen, I think, for displacive transmissions, uh, where you, know, you generate the crystal structure by a deformation of the parent lattice, and the movement of the interface is at the rate controlled by the diffusion of the interstitial element. It cannot happen with uh, diffusional or reconstructive transformations because there is necessarily a movement of atoms. Okay, so it has never been verified experimentally that the para equilibrium concept exists for anything other than um, a displacive transformation. So, you know, I, I pointed out to you perlite. 
Well, that is a classic uh, diffusional transformation, and you can see that there is always partitioning of elements. Now, the second question is from Sandeep Ghosh Chowdhury, and it asks, does it mean that NPLE does not exist at all? My answer would be yes. Uh, in all the calculations that I've seen, the diffusion distances are too small to be physically correct, okay? And of course, the cost of creating a steep concentration gradient is not taken into account, including uh, in the software Dictra and in uh, MatCalc and any other software which does these calculations. Shiv asked the question that the partitioning coefficient of chromium is less than the equilibrium value. Uh, so th that's referring to this graph. You can see that the partitioning is far less, okay? So if, if negligible partitioning doesn't exist, then what determines the partitioning? Well, we have to abandon the concept of local equilibrium when we are dealing with temperatures which are too low to allow substantial diffusion to happen. So when you abandon that concept, you have to use other theory, which has what we call interface functions, all right? Interface response functions. So for example, uh, when an element is transferred across the interface, even though its free energy increases because the interface is moving too fast, uh, that is an interface response function because that will influence the velocity of the interface. And there are methods where we have uh, solved simultaneously three or four interface response functions to work out what the composition of the phase should be. That hasn't been applied to perlite, but it has certainly been uh, applied to other, other transformations, uh, even in steels. Uh, so we cannot assume uh, always that local equilibrium will be satisfied at the interface. So Shiv, if you, do you have a response to that or? Yeah, yeah. So you're asking whether that is okay. I think that means that uh, there is no, no partitioning, right? If it is close to one. The, this, uh, for, for bainite, there is no partitioning, okay? Yeah. But for perlite at low temperatures, is it showing that it's close to one? No, no it's not close to one. It's uh, bigger than one. Okay. Bainite is one. Okay. But it's still less than equilibrium value. Which oh, is far, far less. Equilibrium. Far less. Yeah. So, which means it is still some phases has excess amount of chromium. Yeah. So, the chromium is trapped. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah because the equilibrium concentration is much greater. So it also means that in every condition we'll have only local equilibrium, then how do we fix the tie line that the system will choose? Yeah, so, so um, as I said to you, I, I think when we get to low temperatures, local equilibrium cannot exist. Okay? So we have to yeah, use the different... At, at high temperatures, how do we choose the tie line then? Oh, high, high temperatures, uh, so, I only mentioned one part uh, of, um, of the problem, which is the negligible partitioning local equilibrium, okay? Yeah. Uh, but of course, um, if you are working at high temperatures or, or more accurate, accurately at... Um, low supersaturations. Low supersaturations. Then, uh, you know, you will get long range partitioning of manganese, uh, which can diffuse faster, yeah? Faster at high temperatures and yeah. almost no partitioning, uh, almost no gradient of carbon okay. in the austenite so that it compensates for the large diffusion coefficient of uh, carbon. Yeah. yeah. That partitioning local equilibrium. Okay, now um, SNT says, does the impossibility of NPL condition depend upon temperature? Absolutely. So I have not seen any example 
where the diffusion distance of NPLE is physically meaningful. But I can conceive that at some temperature or another, uh, which is high enough, you might get that possibility, okay? That uh, the diffusion distance is reasonable and therefore you have the NPLE mode. But if you're working at temperatures where diffusion is slow, then it's unlikely. The gradient basically cannot be steep. That's the condition, okay? Are you happy with that, SND? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so then uh, there's a question from uh, K. Gupta 27. In what condition NPLE and para-equilibrium exist and how do they depend on supersaturation? Both of the modes of transmission really can only happen at high supersaturation, okay? Uh, and where NPLE probably doesn't exist at all at high supersaturations because that means low temperatures. But para-equilibrium can continue to, uh, you know, quite low temperatures. So you can generate Friedman sudden ferrite, for example, at 600 degrees centigrade and uh, under para-equilibrium conditions. Happy with that? Yeah, so, uh, in reverse transformation, how does they differ? Means uh, uh, you are talking about uh, uh, when transformation is taking place from osmite to ferrite. Yes. And if the transformation takes place from saturated uh, ferrite to osmite, uh, they differ. Actually, they... That's a good question. I haven't actually thought at all about, about that. Um, if we are going from ferrite to austenite and you superheat sufficiently, yes, then, yes. Then yes. it's quite possible that you could get NPLE. Okay. No, I don't know. That might be worth simulating to see how big the profile, how, how big the diffusion distance is. Yeah, you could do that in Dictra, for example, or MatCalc. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. That's inspired me. Um, okay. The next one is by uh, Aparao. Why can't we fix the problem of diffusion distance uh, when it is below a critical value by assuming that there is no diffusion? Uh, so, so I think uh, it would of course mean that it's a breakdown of local equilibrium. And that breakdown might be per equilibrium condition. But as I said to you, per equilibrium may not exist at all for reconstructive transformations because they necessarily require the movement of ion atoms to cancel out any shape deformation. So there is no experimental evidence for para-equilibrium growth of allotromorphic ferrite or perlite. Yeah, happy with that, Appa? Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, then uh, Bharat Ganesh, yeah. Why we neglect strain energy contribution during a reconstructive transformation? Uh, good question. So the only sort of change uh, which would contribute to strain energy would be the volume change in a reconstructive transformation, okay? Now, the effect of the volume change can be mitigated by the diffusion that happens because that in itself uh, will happen in a way which, you know, maximizes equilibrium and therefore minimizes strain energy. But there will be a small contribution from strain energy. You are right. Yeah. Is that okay, Bharati Ganesh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Then the question is from Sasida. If we think of a diffuse interface theory working here. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Are the chemical potentials now calculated while considering this? If not, can we really determine if there is an interfacial equilibrium or not? So I think uh, the theory that I outlined by Hilliard yeah, is actually for a diffuse interface like this, you know, uh, where um, you, have, uh, you have this, but there's no structural change across there. And it's taken into account by having this gradient energy term, 
here, which effectively is like an interfacial energy because of the variation in composition. Okay? And according to this calculation and taking typical NPLE um, diffusion distances, it would make it impossible uh, because the cost is far greater than the driving force for transformation. Is that okay, Shashita? Okay, so um, the next question is by Gerald Tennyson. Uh, good question. Uh, what is your comment on utilizing the phase field approach for capturing? So uh, this actually is the same equation that's used in the phase field method. And one of the key problems is that you cannot actually capture the proper interface in a phase field method because, you know, you you cannot have a very, very, very large computational power to model very, very small interface widths because the interface is not diffuse. It's, it's actually a first order transformation between austenite and ferrite. So there's a sharp interface and there are no phase field approaches that I'm aware of which capture the physics of that interface. So this equation here is actually the equation that is embedded in phase field theory. Is that okay, Gerald? Uh, yes, Professor, yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so Sashida, I'm not sure whether, um, you know, the local liberation of heat uh, will matter unless the rate of transformation is very high. So for example, for martensitic transformation at sub-zero temperatures, uh, the enthalpy change alters, uh, the, the recalescence, the heat given out, actually alters the way in which the interface moves. But the rates of transformation at high temperature are too small, I think, uh, for individual interfaces to be affected. Um, now, of course, if you are dealing with a very large chunk of material, then that will give rise to um, a peak in temperature in the cooling curve simply because you can't dissipate heat high enough. But that's a collective effect of all the transformations going on. Uh, Jayant Mahatu asks, uh, I request you next time to give a lecture on deformation behaviors of different stacking fault energy materials. I will do my best, okay? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Shiv, um, diffusion rate must depend on defect density. None of your equations consider defect. Are they all embedded in the activation energy defect should affect the degree and the rate of partitioning? So, um, people have talked about grain boundary diffusion, for example. Uh, but you should note that when the ferrite interface advances, uh, the grain boundary diffusion is along the boundary rather than across it. And the diffusion coefficient across the boundary is much closer to the volume diffusion term than inside the boundary. In the case of perlite, the situation is different because actually the flux is parallel to the boundary, uh, going from uh, the carbon rejected by the ferritic component to the carbon rejected by the um, cementite, uh, absorbed by the cementite. So in that case, boundary diffusion is a big feature of transformation kinetics and it is taken into account. Uh, now, if you have deformed the austenite so that there are lots and lots of uh, dislocations and so on, that will have a consequence on diffusion. I don't know how big a consequence it would be, but it's something that should be looked at. Okay, Shiv? Yeah, that was Professor Manna asking. Well, uh, oh. Professor Bhavishya, for a change, this is Indranil Manna, not uh, Shiv. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. But, uh, but you're right that, yes, in case of uh, boundary diffusion control processes, uh, uh, these defects have a much uh, higher um, uh, effect. But even in uh, cases of binary or ternary where the uh, diffusions are substitutional in nature, not interstitial like carbon in iron. Uh, 
local concentration of defects like dislocation density, even point defect clusters, they uh, certainly will have uh, a significant effect because the diffusion distance here is very small. Interlaminar spacing is, uh, I mean, less than a micrometer in some cases. So right. there, these defect concentrations uh, may actually change. In fact, since you alluded to boundary diffusion, and I can recall from my own experience many years ago on uh, discontinuous precipitation or cellular precipitation. So there we routinely see this phenomenon that in the solute depleted matrix phase, the solute distribution is parabolic, minimum in the center and maximum at the, uh, I'm sorry, the other way around, uh, maximum in the center of the solute depleted uh, phase and max uh, minimum at the uh, gamma alpha or whatever the precipitate matrix interface. I'm talking okay. about the phase lamellar aggregate. So I thought uh, uh, since we are talking about partitioning, uh, I thought defect densities will definitely uh, have a role to play. But in classical systems, when we consider equilibrium, probably we don't talk about uh, crystalline defects at all. Yeah, so, so, you know, if you look at the aluminum copper system, uh, there's no question that if you deform the material before aging it to produce the precipitation, then things change uh, dramatically. So there is a role. I, th I think you are right. There is a, a, a role, but uh, I don't think it has been looked at significantly in this context. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Gerald uh, uh, is asking a question that, where can we apply the concept of the thermodynamics of irreversible processes? And again, you know, it's a very nice question, which I'm going to resort to my teaching lectures. Um, so, you know, I didn't talk about this, but there are many processes in which you don't have one force and one flux acting at the same time. And just to give you a common everyday example, you have a thermocouple, all right? And a temperature difference gives rise to an electrical potential. So if you can write an equation like this, that the rate of energy dissipation is the sum of all the fluxes and forces, the products of all the um, fluxes and forces, okay? Then you can also say that, look, the flux of temperature, or let's say the flux of carbon, will not only depend on the potential gradient of carbon, but also on the potential gradient of manganese. So if you are cooling a sample, then you have definitely got heat flow and you might have other things happening. And these do not necessarily work independently depending on the magnitudes of these cross coefficients, okay? Uh, so do this experiment at home, but after doing a risk assessment, that you've taken a hot dish, right? And you put one end of the hot dish in a stream of water, you will see that the end you are holding will get hotter. That goes against intuition, right? Because heat should flow towards the colder end. So you take a hot dish, right? Uh, which you can hold in your hand. So you, be careful, right? Uh, and put the other end in a stream of water and you will see that it heats up. So you are getting there an interaction of a flux with a different force than its own force. So it's possible, and uh, I think it's a, it's a wonderful subject, which, um, which can be applied to a variety of scenarios where you have more than one thing happening. Okay, Gerald? Yes, yeah, yeah, I got yes. it, yeah. Okay. So we're just asking from an additive manufacturing perspective, that's all. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, um, a very difficult process, okay? <laughs> yeah. So SNT is asking, uh, if local equilibrium breaks down, uh, then how do we explain the phase transformation uh, at high undercoolings in terms of velocity? Yeah, so this is similar to um, a question that was uh, asked uh, previously. So what, what you have is uh, something called interface response functions. So you take a variety of processes that are happening at the interface, and then you solve them simultaneously. Uh, so you're no longer restricting yourself to local equilibrium, okay? And 
uh, I will I will put a link um, link um, on the chat towards the end describing these uh, interface response uh, functions. Uh, so it is possible to do. Um, I'll put a link uh, later on. Okay. S and T. Okay, sir. That was helpful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then uh, the question is, does it help to consider the diffusion coefficient as a function of local composition and the parameter associated with the interfacial energy? Certainly, uh, with respect to local composition, you know, the, uh, the diffusivity of carbon is a strong function of concentration. And Trivedi, many years ago, uh, produced a way of taking account of the variation of the diffusion coefficient along the gradient. And we do that routinely, okay? Whether, um, whether your second part, which is interfacial energy, that only matters, I suppose, if you are getting boundary diffusion. Yeah? And remember that all of these parameters are basically unknown because even if we assume an interfacial energy, uh, boundary energy depends on so many parameters um, that you're only using a global average there. Okay, Appa? Yes. Yeah, okay. Then uh, Shivas, how about your Antarctica slide, uh, which actually comes from my sister? Here, the chemical potential difference is also very large. No, no. No, because uh, they are in equilibrium. The ice and the salt are in equilibrium with each other. So there will never be any driving force or movement. Uh, from I mean, mu is, as you know, is mu zero plus RTL and AI. AI is your NSCL. There is almost zero NSCL is in your eyes and almost saturated NSCL in your uh, in your uh, brine water or sea water. So there got to be a chemical potential difference. You cannot say that this is a uh, you know, a thermodynamic equilibrium case where both the chemical potentials are the same. So Sorry, explain, uh, uh, explain again why there is a chemical potential difference? Because there's a very definition of chemical potential, the fundamental equation, mu i is mu i zero standard one plus RTL and AI. And AI depends on concentration. And concentration of sodium chloride in both the sides are drastically different. And that's why there is a chemical potential gradient as well. No, there doesn't have to be. Doesn't have why to not? be. Why not, Harry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, yeah. So, so uh, if there is a difference, there would be uh, uh, partitioning. But here we have a common tangent between the ice and the water. Uh, not, not here. Hmm. Not here. Well, yes, you can have a common tangent between ice and water, but not in this case. Yeah. Um, so, so when you are stranded at sea, okay? Yeah, you are stranded at sea. When you are stranded at sea, try and have some ice instead of the sea water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I will take that for an answer, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, we old people talk like that. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, the final question is from K. Gupta. When manganese diffusion is not taking place, does the velocity of the interface uh, given by the mobility of iron and multiply? Absolutely right. When, uh, of course, I'm assuming there's no other solutes. Yeah. So okay. when, when it is a pure substance, uh, like pure iron, uh, the, you can only, um, the only process controlling the movement of the interface is the transfer of atoms across the interface. And yes. in irreversible thermodynamics, right? Uh, the, the one example that I didn't mention was the velocity being proportional to delta the transfer of, the transfer of atom across the interface. We can consider only iron atom transferring uh, uh, from the interface. Yeah, yeah, because it's a different structure they have to form. Yeah. So the velocity okay. is proportional to the driving force delta G, and if you multiply okay. velocity by delta G you get an energy dissipation rate, okay? Okay. Now, irreversible thermodynamics has no fundamental justification, all right? So I cannot tell you at what point 
that velocity will remain proportional to delta G. That can only be discovered by experiment, okay? So if you have a very large driving force, then, you know, the other terms uh, in the polynomial might become important, okay? Okay, guys, um, I'm really delighted uh, that, you know, uh, 100 Sir, there is one question, one question from one of my colleagues, Hari, if you can take that. Okay. 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 Just speak out, that will be easier. Okay. Yeah. Hari, uh, Sibala, orientation effect on diffusion is still not very uh, well uh, defined, maybe very small amount, but ferrite, transforming ferrite, its orientation, can it have a, any effect on this partitioning? Yes, sir. Uh, Yes, uh, so actually the diffusion coefficient is a matrix of diffusion coefficients depending on um, orientation in, in a, a non-cubic system, okay? Uh, but um, I think uh, in the case of steels where we have cubic austenite and cubic ferrite, uh, the diffusion coefficient doesn't vary with direction as far as I know. But uh, it's definitely the case that, you know, if you're looking at uh, cementite, which is orthorhombic, then the properties will vary with the crystallographic orientation. Okay, thank, thank you. Okay, many thanks everybody. And uh, I really enjoyed this and we should do this more often. Okay? Okay, okay. Harry, we will then meet maybe more often. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, you know. I. I wouldn't even mind giving a whole course if you if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we will we will have that. Let the semesters begin in this country, here in India. Okay. Then we will have a full course sometime. Okay. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye. 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 bye.